Hello all. Uh, thank you all so much uh, for coming out. I know it's like been a long day, uh, especially with the, the, um, the presentation I ate this morning. Like, I have to be here, you lot don't. So, uh, really appreciate it. Um, and so, you know, there's got to be no cool, like, uh, uh, new features release at this talk or whatever, but I think, like, this topic and some of the stuff here that I'm going to go through, uh, is, like, can be make or break to a company's success, to a team's success, to an organization's success. Um, and so hopefully there's some stuff here that like, you can take away back to your own uh, abode of work, um, and, can, and uh, hopefully something will resonate here with you. Um, so just to start off, uh, a little bit of audience, audience interaction. Um, does anyone, who knows who Intercom is? Like, how many of you know what, what the, those words are? Cool, cool. Uh, any Intercom users? <laughs> A few, a few, that's good. Um, so, uh, so I'm uh, an engineer at Intercom, and so we're, we're a, a business messaging startup, um, and our mission is to make internet business personal. Uh, I'll talk a little bit, a bit more later on uh, about what we do and then why it's relevant. Um, and so my role at Intercom is um, a principal engineer, so my background is in systems engineering. Uh, I've worked in a variety of places, including Amazon, for a good amount of time. I used to work on low-level infrastructure, like their DNS and low balancing infrastructure. Um, but mostly my career has been spent bouncing around between engineering management and uh, actual engineering. So I've spent a fair bit of time kind of working on, I guess, the higher level work, uh, like translating business needs into engineering needs and stuff. So um, what I'm gonna be talking about here with principles is pretty, pretty relevant to that. Um, so, uh, I'm going to go through why, what, what, what are principles and why they're useful and uh, why they can be interesting for your organization, um, how we use them in, uh, in, in Intercom, uh, and then kind of how they, how they go in practice as well. Uh, in, uh, as in, I'm going to go through a few examples of how we use our own principles and then uh, put them into practice regarding some uses of AWS. Um, so, uh, so I'm talking here about principles used by your team or company or organization. Uh, like there are good generalized software engineering principles, say like about around testability, writing unit tests, writing simple code, not repeating yourself, that kind of thing. These are good and these are like fundamental engineering principles and they're very useful and uh, useful to know as an engineer. Um, but they don't particularly help your teams build the right thing or go about building the right thing in the right way. So the role of principles really is to like be a set of decisions and learnings that your, your organization uses to figure out how to go about building the things. So um, at Intercom, we believe that successful and exceptional organizations do two things really well. One is uh, figuring out what to build. So that's effectively your product strategy. Uh, and then once you know what to build, that you go about building it well. Um, and to make sure that you keep on doing that, you have to learn, you have to encode things, you have to scale that over years. Um, and so principles is a useful tool of making sure that when you figure out how to, how to actually build what you want to build, that you continue to do this. So, uh, you know, they help your organization learn, to learn, to, to grow, to establish working patterns. Um, and without the common set of principles, you can't be sure that your teams are building stuff the right way without a huge amount of work involved, say, with leadership and that kind of thing. So, so how do you know like, that your team are going about uh, uh, things the right way. Um, so the, like, there are cr you, can, you can make uh, like educated guess uh, like whether some, a, a decision is correct. You can ask leadership, you can ask senior engineers, whoever's in charge. Uh, you, know, you can copy what you've seen done elsewhere or like, you can mimic what, you've, what, what has worked for you in the past in your career, and that can work pretty well. Um, you can also you know, pick something that somebody said at a cool tech conference where every presentation is full of unicorns and rainbows and successful projects, and this can also work. But really, what is important is that you uh, do the right thing for your own organization. Um, so uh, by encoding the success, it means you get to repeat the behaviors that led to positive outcomes uh, and avoid previous like failure cases. Um, and the value of this is that anyone from 
in the organization, once these kind of principles are established, uh, a new joiner knows how to like, read the minds of the most experienced people in the organization, that uh, there's no amnesia when it comes to building something new. And so that's really powerful. It enables teams to build stuff in the knowledge that the way they're going about things aligns roughly with the way the accepted guidance or accepted practices in the, in the company um, to make sure that things go well. So, you know, there can be exceptions here, uh, and there's lots of ways that good things can happen, but like a set of written down principles give you something to work off of which, and it means that there's less guesses and less uh, uh, chaos in your organization. Um, so, uh, I'm gonna go through like just a little bit about, say, what a bad principle might look at and what a, a good principle would look with. Um, but the, uh, I first came across principles in my career when I worked at Amazon. So you may have heard about some of the Amazon's leadership principles. They come up in a lot of different talks, such as customer obsession and ownership and even frugality. Um, and these are like truly powerful uh, and real to see in practice. Like teams really understand these and get them and they're encoded in like when teams design a doc or write down a document to design a service or figure it, prioritize what to work on. Um, and so when I joined Intercom, one of the things I was looked at was like, uh, I was looking for a place that really gets uh, this kind of thing very seriously, that we that we we're very deliberate about how we go about our work. And so uh, like Amazon in many ways, Intercom is a place that takes these uh, principles uh, seriously. So what might a bad principle look like? Um, like, is it that big a deal? So I think like, um, uh, a bad principle is like something that doesn't really have an opposite. Uh, it's not really much of a decision. Uh, like this is like a truism, like not shipping bugs. Um, it's probably like unattainable in most environments, not realistic. And the opposite doesn't really work. Like saying our principle is that we ship bugs. I mean, there's not really much software out there where you would want to go about that deliberately. And so there's like a few things interesting about this. It is ambitious and it does set a tone uh, for a team, but mostly I don't think this is very valuable for a team to work with. Um, this, this, this just uh, tells teams that they can't really fail and there's a bunch of anti-patterns going on here. So, you know, nobody wants to, to have bugs um, and there's can definitely uh, differences in the tolerance level depending on what you're working on, but something like this isn't really something that's useful. Um, and you know, like here's some uh, examples of product principles that are kind of reversible. Uh, and you can see that um, like a, pr a principle that uh, dictates that uh, we delight our users and we're like we're fully f uh, functional or we have amazing intricate details also has the opposite of one where you got like a very simple interface and it's fast to get through. And you know, like th these, are, these are completely um, reversible and, ad and uh, appropriate in a bunch of different environments. So uh, Des, by the way, is uh, one of the uh, co-founders of Intercom, which is uh, one of the reasons why I've got him up there. Um, so what could a good principle look like? Um, so here's one that we actually put into practice, but like say we build on AWS, um, so it's a good principle because I'm at an AWS conference, but uh, this is like simple to understand, it's opinionated, and there's obvious op uh, opposite cases which can be more than appropriate uh, to, to, to put into practice. And so you know, building in, an, in AWS may not be appropriate in a bunch of environments uh, if you require like sub millisecond latency in very, low, uh, very small uh, geographic regions or you know, your company's got significant investment in local data centers they run or you, know, you need cloud diversity or whatever. These are, these are all completely good reasons to, uh, to not have that as your, as, uh, your principle. So a uh, principle like this speeds work up for your teams. You, they, they know what to do without guessing, without having to ask around, without having to uh, you know, do the wrong thing and get, and get told off or whatever. Something simple like this uh, enables teams and helps them grow and build stuff into practice. So, you know, like what, uh, how to go about thinking about what the principles are and how they work in your environment is like looking at what, uh, what act people actually do. Um, so it shouldn't be uh, something ideal, something that uh, uh, is ambitious, uh, but you, you don't, you're not doing it yet. Um, these, these, that, that's not something that uh, you should be uh, like aspiring to. You should be looking for decisions that are already made and used in, in production as such in your ex company today. Um, look at what you truly do believe in. 
uh, and that uh, isn't just something that is an anti-pattern that your teams happen to be doing. Um, and like businesses change, practices change, companies grow, and you learn uh, things as you go along. So it's definitely the case that we look at our principles kind of every year or two or so and, uh, and up, uh, update them. And then, you know, test them. Like make sure that they are kind of robust and clear and uh, that they do actually help out teams. So that's the introduction about principles. Uh, so how to put them into, or what, what are our own principles? So I'm just gonna describe a little bit about what Intercom do and what we are first, um, to give you a little bit of context. So like I said before, the teams I work with in Intercom are like the kind of lower level um, kind of infrastructure, cloud services, uh, data storage, security, IT, those kind of teams. Um, but these principles like go across all of our engineering organization. And so uh, what Intercom does is we have a suite of messaging first products to like accelerate growth um, across all parts of the customer life cycle. So that's like talking to your customers that's for support or for sales. Um, and so businesses use Intercom to do like marketing, product tours, um, and all mostly through uh, a, a messenger. So we're split between Dublin and, and San Francisco largely. Um, and I'm based in Dublin, as you can probably tell from my accent. Uh, so here's our messenger. There's like some pretty nice things in here. It's got GIFs and emojis and like applications embedded. Um, so some pretty sophisticated stuff going on these days with uh, the state of uh, messengers these days. Um, and one of our decisions is like I had that principle earlier on of like being all in on AWS. So we made the decision a long time ago to, to build on top of AWS to partner pretty closely with them and to uh, not go down multi-cloud paths or anything like that. Um, and so, uh, like as with everything in the real world, our principles are work in progress, we revisit them, um, but what we do have today is like battle-hardened and tested in the real world, and we're pretty happy to share them to the outside world. Um, so we've got a, a, a handful of principles that, we, uh, that are relevant across our R&D organization, so they think they, they address how we think about building product in general and building the entirety of Intercom. Then we've got principles which are specific to our design team and how we design our product. And finally, we've got principles that apply to our engineering. And now there's a little bit of overlap between them, um, but I'm only gonna look at the relevant ones here, uh, largely the uh, engineering ones. Um, there's different ones that uh, apply to different parts of our product building uh, organization. Um, so uh, one of the, the main ones, and this applies everywhere, is that we shift to learn. So this is universal across our R&D org. Um, and so the, the reasons why, why we think this is important is that the sooner we ship, uh, or like shipping is a process that we use to learn from. We, 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 rather than doing a lot of upfront work to figure out exactly how a, uh, a feature will be used or, or uh, do, doing a lot of experimentation or like trying to guess uh, what things, uh, what the outcome of things will be, we bias towards shipping sooner and getting stuff into the hands of real users and so that we learn how our product is used and then iterate. So, um, you know, shipping the initial feature or, or like the MVP of a feature is the start of the process. We deliberately don't ship and don't come back to it. We ship and look at how something is used and iterate. So we believe that great products are built using this way, and it's actually pretty consistent what Intercom is used for and very powerful at, by, you know, by having a, a, a business messenger that allows people to be in communication with, say, back-end developers and uh, with the real users who use your product. It allows you to have these like, really short, iter iterative uh, life cycles when it comes to like, building and rolling something out. So, We'd rather get something out quicker that's functional, but incomplete. You know, we, we don't want to have to understand or figure out everything in advance. We want to uh, get it out there and learn for how it's actually well used. So this works well for us. This is appropriate to our kind of business. Um, you know, I wouldn't apply this if I was building software for a control system for a nuclear power plant or, say, back in my days in, in Amazon when I was working on the net, in the networking organization, shipping to learn in that kind of environment uh, would definitely not be as appropriate where, depending on the risk levels. But for, like, features of a, of a messenger, it's probably appropriate. Um, we also build in small steps. So this, uh, this kind of goes along with uh, shipping to learn. 
um, in that it's related because it means we're getting small things out, observing them, and then uh, you know, by making small changes frequently, uh, we break work down into safer, smaller steps. Um, and so this influences how we think about shipping code. Uh, we would much rather uh, get code out using a CI CD pipeline uh, with like, you know, pretty small uh, risk-free uh, uh, chunks of code that get out many, many times a day. Um, and so this doesn't just refer to those like code deploys and pull requests. Um, but also, uh, you know, other testing and production techniques, such as using feature flags, um, and you know, this like being iterative and assistive is like pretty agile, uh, as in it's con compatible with agile development processes. Um, and there's secondary benefits that we believe that this really helps, say, our availability and our quality, as it's easier for us to understand what just broke and easier to roll back things, or easier to um, see if we're suddenly getting more exceptions that this small bit of code or this small change or this feature flag change influenced that. So uh, shipping in small steps is something that uh, we've gotten good at over time. We've invested a lot in the likes of our CI, CD pipeline in that. Um, and our entire environment allows us to uh, frequently and easily ship to production, uh, which is something we invest a lot in. Uh, we're also technically conservative, and um, this means that you know, maybe we could solve a certain problem uh, using a graph database deployed, using Kubernetes, backed up into blockchain, using quantum computing or whatever. Like the, we, the, these are all interesting and useful and valuable technologies in a bunch of ways. Uh, and you can do like extraordinary work with them individually. Um, but what we would much rather do is see our teams reuse patterns and reuse software and reuse um, even entire applications uh, to, to, to solve a problem. Um, the, when we're looking at a design for something, we break things down into, like, can we solve this problem with tools and techniques that we already know well? Uh, and so one of the manifestations of this is uh, like a practice we call run less software, which is we prefer to run a smaller set of software and services, and ones we preferably don't have to run ourselves at all. So this is, again, consistent with our use of AWS. We much rather, say, go all in on using Aurora MySQL than tuning MySQL databases ourselves. Even though we, that could give us a lot more power and control, we, we'd rather not invest in that and uh, go all in on managed solutions like Aurora MySQL. Um, so this doesn't mean we don't build like beautiful functional product uh, or that that isn't say consistent with what uh, the modern standards of really good applications are but our implementation choices uh, in the back end especially will be quite conservative and you know we, we will reuse things uh, in many ways um, we also try to keep things simple so uh, this has implications in terms of things like performance and say financial cost and perfect abstractions to keep it along the way. Well, uh, at our stage of growth or where our company is at, say like, so AWS cost is something that's near and dear to my heart and cost management and I'll talk a little bit about it a bit more. Um, but like it's not the primary goal of our engineering organization to uh, do massive optimizations to uh, save like a, uh, certain amounts of dollars. Like, we, uh, we're a successful startup, but not yet uh, fully established. And so saving a few thousand dollars here and there doesn't necessarily make a meaningful difference to whether Intercom is going to be a long-term success. Like we are, uh, whereas building and iterating on new features could. So uh, we'll like avoid optimizations or we'll avoid uh, cer certain types of work which can be uh, completely valid uh, if when you're starting to have a more long-term view on things. So, um, but also this influences things like uh, the interfaces we have internally and you know, this can change over time. Uh, the, the complexity that can come out of larger environments or bigger scale environments uh, is something we'd rather avoid uh, for now and so keeping things simple is uh, something we direct teams to do. Um, one last one is just, we, we have like a deliberately positive attitude around what we build and how we go about our work. Uh, so there's no technical influence, or there's no technical outcomes to this one, but it is a, a solid part of our engineering principles that uh, we, we're, we're like uh, optimistic and we are uh, eager to teach and learn and to build our team and so and welcoming to everybody. And so I think this, this is a, it's, it doesn't have technical implications, but it does go influence how we go about our work. And it's an important part of uh, these kind of principles uh, that you influence your culture, the culture of uh, how work is done in your team as much as 
setting how uh, the like how the technology or how the features are implemented. Um, so these things, like these are posters that we have up around our office. Uh, we talk about them, we've got blog posts and we've done like a lot of internal uh, chats about these things. Um, and so they're readily accessible. People could contribute them as they're being made up. Um, and so they're not, you know, things that we, uh, aren't challengeable. Uh, we do have lots of cases of where uh, we go against them, but as like as default positions, we think they're pretty solid for, for our business. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna talk through how some of these look in practice. So this is a bit more uh, practical, and I can go into a bit more depth in our use of AWS. Um, so I mentioned AWS costs. Um, so this is something I, I work on a lot. Um, and uh, I guess our, what we like to see is the application of our principles and kind of best practices and industry awareness into our cost setup. So we believe we've got a pretty efficient and appropriate uh, setup. Um, and so we can look into how uh, this does influence us. So as I'm sure many of you are aware of, like understanding your AWS bill can be pretty complex. Like there's a whole cottage industry of companies and consultants who are more than happy to take money off you for, in return for making your bill easier or life, uh, or like bill smaller or life easier. Um, and so I think the hard part of things is really like knowing when it's worthwhile to uh, go after costs and reduce them, um, and knowing when the investment is worth it. Um, so, uh, like, unfortunately, that can that can mean just keeping up with the industry, keeping up with best practices, and so you know, there's lots of different good sources out there uh, to, uh, to to keep on top of things. And uh, I play a role in making sure that Intercom is, uh, you know, w well informed as to our uh, setup. Um, but one of the things that I do as like uh, one of the costs team is uh, like try and scale out the, f the function a bit. So like uh, we like writing things down at Intercom, and so uh, I don't work alone on these things. Um, but in order, to, in order to scale out this function and help it grow, whatever, and also like think about our, our AWS architecture in general, um, is that we write down a lot of these things. Uh, and so we got like documents. Uh, this one here. Um, that is guidance that reflects our actual usage of AWS. And there's a bunch of decisions that are in here that are encoded into the document. Um, and so I recommend going about writing a bunch of decisions that are appropriate uh, that have been made in, in your environment, including like how you go about costs or which things to prioritize. Um, what we don't do is uh, try and mimic all, uh, like recreate all of the good documentation that's out there, whether it's on AWS's site themselves or in this case, um, this is the open guide to Amazon Web Services, which is a community written guide, uh, which I like linking to because it's uh, like AWS's documentation is re really good, but the community guide is written by engineers who use AWS and it aims to be like a living, useful resource uh, that consolidates links and learnings and tips and best practices and give you kind of a, a a kind of bite-sized amount of information about uh, how to think about some of the services. So it arose from discussion, discu like discussing and editing by several engineers who have used AWS extensively. Um, that's pretty concise and readable. Uh, it has a pretty good Slack community as well. So like my, the first thing that I have in my document is like this is not an authoritative source of um, all information about all of AWS. Point folks to like read this doc, um, the, op the open guide, uh, and then you can look at uh, some of the decisions we made uh, that are uh, specific to Intercom in my own documentation. Um, so back to the doc. So here's like a pretty important quote. Um, so we are deliberately reactive and we prioritize uh, taking actions against the highest contributors as we observe in production. So um, this is kind of consistent with like shipping to learn um, that uh, at all, where we're at all possible, we avoid a bunch of upfront conversations during product development, like, you know, should I worry about costs or how much will this cost us? Uh, we'd, we'd rather just not figure out that problem. We want to ship. Uh, and get the stuff out there, get it used, and learn from real world usage. Um, so the, there are some exceptions to this. Uh, we have got some pretty large fleets uh, that have a large infrastructural impact, say like Elasticsearch uh, uh, that we run in t on our own EC2 servers is pretty large. And so if we were gonna double that, it's pretty obvious that we should be considering costs um, as it's uh, very meaningful and, and we have a good understanding of what it's gonna be like in, pr in production. But 
th this means that uh, product teams, uh, for the most part, are discouraged from doing upfront work to understand these things, like the impact of their uh, features, um, because we believe it's probably wasted uh, time. Um, we'll, we'll understand it far better once it's actually been out there and used, and it's consistent with our ship, shipping to learn um, principles. So like, uh, the benefit also, it also helps that the benefit of optimization work is easier to see after something has been optimized when it's actually in production. So it's, it's far better, it's easy, far easier to measure something once you've actually reduced the cost of something. Otherwise, you're relying on a lot of uh, speculation at times to know that something is actually useful. So, uh, yeah, we believe this is consistent with building in small steps and shipping to learn, uh, and it works for us. Um, but it mightn't work for your environment where, say, you, you're under strict financial control or you've got a lot of uh, control between different organizations and cross-org billing and stuff like that, or you've got exceptionally tight margins or uh, very, very small amounts of money to work with, but um, this is fine for us. Um, another thing is that we, well, I mentioned that we're all in AWS. We also say we just don't want you to think about other uh, cloud services. Um, so we, def we uh, run less software, we default to using AWS services rather than running our own, uh, say, MySQL clusters. We do run our own Elasticsearch clusters. Um, so uh, we're not uh, dogmatic about this. Um, but when it comes to, say, looking at other cloud options, we just don't want teams to be thinking about this uh, during their like, product development time. So like, you know, we, we really see the, the value of uh, our uh, AWS of, like, and cloud system services in general is like tying them all together and the, the sum of the parts. Um, so you know, the amount of overhead it takes to get like a well-run uh, AWS setup uh, or any other kind of environment can be tough like, when it comes to permissions and network designs, understanding security and all that. Um, and we just don't want to go down the path of having to learn this, relearn this multiple times, or using the lowest common denominator functionality um, because we want to get one or two uh, bits of functionality out of other services. Um, and so uh, we, uh, that said, we do use other SaaS services such as Honeycomb and Gremlin and Datadog uh, that don't require necessarily a lot of complex configuration uh, and don't have the same kind of barrier. Uh, but like cloud services as, as uh, our cloud platforms do have uh, come with a lot of baggage and barriers. Um, so it's less confusing, less work to use one uh, cloud provider well and use a small selection of uh, single uh, purpose world-class SaaS providers uh, to kind of help run our business. Um, and so uh, this again ties back to the engineering principles of being technically conservative and keeping things simple. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's very few uh, user-facing features or products that like massively benefit from being hosted in multiple uh, clouds. Uh, the actual end user impact of, of this, uh, of contemplating this work and going down this road, uh, is pretty minimal. And so we don't want our engineers worrying about this and spending time trying to get things up and running. So we kind of cut out those decisions pretty early. Um, you know, like what's driving our bill? We, we use a large number of instances to serve our application. We're a Ruby on Rails monolith, which I'll talk about a little bit about later. We self-host Elasticsearch for some large data sets. So Typically, EC2 uh, tends to dominate. Um, there's a lot of RDS MySQL in there as well, and Elasticash. Um, and so we, we do a bunch of simple, well-known best practices to kind of manage these bills. And as you can see, like, we try and proportionately uh, spend our time, our management time, on roughly uh, this kind of breakdown here as well. So we look at the bill, look what it's like in production, go, well, you know, 50% of our uh, bill or whatever is EC2, so therefore we're going to spend 50% of our time optimizing EC2. And so it's just simple stuff like managing reservations, right sizing, good instance choices, uh, encouraging use of spot, and making sure that we know where it's good to use. Um, and optimizing our application and seeing uh, anomalous kind of interactions or anomalous use of resources um, where we think it could be worth uh, spending optimizing. So we manage this centrally rather than getting every team to figure out this stuff uh, for themselves, kind of look globally across our organization and apply these kind of simple, well-known management practices across uh, our, our bill as effectively as possible without spending huge amounts of time. Um, I think like this is our EC2, just roughly the breakdown of where our spend was uh, a couple of months ago. Um, and so, you know, we're reasonably well proportioned there in terms of uh, a lot of reservations, uh, some decent spot use. 
Um, and kind of weirdly annoying, some unused reservations uh, popping up there, almost uh, eclipsing on demand at times. Um, so like uh, th this, this work is getting easier with the likes of savings plans that recent, recently got released. So I'd expect these to kind of improve over time. But like overall, our, we think our strategy is working as I think these numbers are, uh, are ratios uh, in, in this case, kind of show that uh, we're, we're being reasonably effective without having to invest like a huge amount of time and, cost, uh, uh, and effort into it. Though I probably do need to look at some of those unused reservations. Um, so uh, yeah, like to support some of these practices, we tag resources, use automation where possible, and we use just simple tools like Cost Explorer uh, to visualize these trends. We don't use any third-party stuff, um, and uh, really use the basic tools that Amazon provide us. Um, so again, we're being pretty simple here. We're not writing a load of complicated software or uh, having to like learn how to use other uh, systems or whatever. Uh, we can get good support from Amazon from uh, for these tools as well. So. Uh, making pretty simple choices here. Um, we, we understand our own usage as well, so we're not just looking at these graphs. Um, we're understanding like pr uh, influences from the product side of things, where traffic are, uh, where our traffic is coming from, uh, and then we use small uh, number of modern instance families to get things like the reservation. Um, efficiency pretty high. Now again, that's getting easier with the likes of savings plans, um, but just having fewer instance types around reduces the cognitive effort of understanding how to right size or which ones to right size. And uh, again, so we just want to give um, uh, our developers uh, just very simple choices that like, oh, this is a me high memory workload or this is a high CPU workload and just have simple choices to make. So don't, we don't definitely don't want to have the most efficient fleet at the cost of a lot of time being spent. Um, we've also recently started using the auto scaling support for spot instances for multiple instance types and purchase options, and just mostly for resilience reasons uh, to make sure that we don't run out of spot hosts. And so the, these features that AWS are shipping over over the last say year or two uh, have just made our life a lot easier uh, with uh, reducing the amount of time while keeping our efficiency and availability of our services nice and high. Um, so yeah, so you know costs they're important. They do give us runway. Uh, their like their money is pretty important to businesses, um, but it's not our top priority. Um, and so uh, we're content with the amount of value we're getting in the investment, um, and we're also confident that uh, our approach, when I went into some of the details there, that I can justify it because they're consistent with our engineering principles. Um, and so you know, if we wanted to, if if it wasn't working for us, or we started getting feedback from leadership, say, on uh, maybe on the finance side or, uh, or elsewhere that our approach wasn't really working, then, then we want to be looking at our principles and seeing what the problem is. But it's working for us at the moment. So next, um, I'm going to talk about our monolith architecture and why it works for us. Um, so we largely have a Ruby on Rails monolith. Uh, and this means we have a single large application with a lot of code uh, that does many, many, many things. Um, so there's UIs, there's uh, APIs, there's helpers, functions. We've got like, lots of workers. They talk to lots of different data stores. Got, um, so it pretty much does everything. We've got most of our business logic in this big lump of uh, Ruby and Rails code. Um, and so monoliths have got a bit of a bad name at the moment. Uh, you know, it's usually followed by phrases like, uh, or like at a, at a conference you might see talks about like, you know, rebuilding things from scratch using Go microservices or uh, monoliths being poorly tested or difficult to deploy, um, and you know, the projects were just complete death marches. Um, or like our monolith, the, the monolith was slowing teams down, so they have to break apart. And so like these are, these are all like talks that you see at conferences, uh, and like they all no doubt um, describe real world situations uh, that, that have uh, impacted teams in these ways, and they have had to break things out. Um, but it's not what we found at Intercom. So we believe that our Ruby on Rails monolith keeps us fast, um, we, but we don't get this for free. So we, we've invested in it over time. So things like making sure we can upgrade it regularly and keep it uh, staying up to date with the latest version of Ruby on Rails, um, that, that may, like, by not, if you ignore this and you suddenly find yourself multiple versions behind and then need to do an upgrade in a panic, that can slow you down and produce unexpected work 
So you need to be disciplined to uh, keep these things uh, and your dependencies up to date. Um, we spent a lot of time, say, refactoring core modules in our monolith to ensure that there's usable, safe boundaries. Um, we deploy it hundreds of times a day. So we have a fully automated CI, CD pipeline, um, and we've built up a lot of scar tissue uh, to, to, to like prevent uh, bad deployments or bad code going out. Um, so we got like reasonably good um, a set of unit tests and integration tests and even things along the way that uh, stop deployments going out and breaking things. So it's a lot of this stuff here that is, takes real investment and is hard work. Um, but if you don't do this stuff regularly, uh, you end up with a monolith that uh, needs to be destroyed like in those, uh, uh, those uh, made up talk titles that I had. And so we believe we've got like a majestic monolith. And so you know, we spent time gardening it through upgrades and uh, making sure we've got good test branches running against development versions of Rails. And we do things like having good code ownership and well-defined boundaries in the code base to stop um, overlapping uh, changes or, or regular breakages. Um, and the main thing is that our developers have a great experience with out-of-the-box patterns and tooling for logs, metrics, scaling, and stuff. Um, and what we've seen, uh, so many, many years ago when I joined, uh, I think we even had it in job specs. We said, you know, we expect to uh, uh, be, be building like lots of microservices. And we'd, a lot of us had come from companies like Amazon that had a, a, a pretty well-run service-oriented architecture. And we kind of expected as we scale and grew uh, in terms of our customer size and team size and stuff that we would end up with lots of these microservices. But and we ended up building a, a, a good few of them. Um, and there's a handful out there which, which, which still work. But what we found over the last two or three years is that teams have been uh, destroying them and folding functionality back into our uh, in, back into the monolith. So um, one of the big ones recently was our webhook service. So we, we had a, a, a standalone Java service which would get notifications of which webhooks uh, you, uh, our customers had set up, um, and then we'd get kind of kind of pings from from our monolith to say, hey, you know, you need to just, or you're subscribing to these uh, webhooks, and we'd figure out how to send them and where to send them. Um, but as we kind of suffered a bit of amnesia of like after the microservice had been written, we weren't really spending that much time writing this Java code. Um, and the functionality kind of became difficult to run as our team changed and grew. And it was actually just not very hard to run that scale of service uh, it, with our monolith. We'd gotten better at uh, running things at scale as we continued to grow and invest in the monolith. The, ex the experience of running it as a developer was just far superior, and our team got motivated to collapse it back in, and it's been uh, like a lot more solid and satisfying and easier to run, and reducing all sorts of risk for us by folding it back in. So this uh, monolith is, uh, again, we observe the pattern and see that we're folding these things back in, and so that's a, a learning and decision that we have. And so uh, we, we, run, uh, we run these things on EC2 instances. Uh, so uh, because we've been running in production with this for about like seven or eight years, uh, we use like the best tools that we had at the time, which was auto scaling groups and um, a kind of early, uh, or what um, Heroku used to package up software, which is called build, build packs. And so this is kind of pre-container times. These are like good building blocks back then, but aren't as sophisticated as, say, using Docker or other kind of uh, things now. But what we do have is like a good unit of deployability, um, which was auto scaling groups. And so we ran in every single worker on, uh, that has a different function on its own auto scaling group. Similarly, we logically separated out uh, all of our APIs into different auto scaling groups and load balancers and kind of split those out. Uh, and now we've ended up at this point with say nearly 250 auto scaling groups uh, for our main application. Um, but they're well understood and there's well, really good patterns for monitoring maintenance and knowing what, to, uh, what things are uh, breaking or not. So teams, again, they know what to expect here. They don't have to do a lot of work to, uh, uh, to, to run this stuff well and get help uh, pretty easily from seeing uh, patterns or from people who are familiar with the way we deploy and run our software. So you know, we're keeping things simple here, we're keeping to learn. We may need to revisit our assumptions. Uh, the amount of work that we invest in making sure that all this stuff works might start to just become a bit, uh, bit too much effort compared to using Kubernetes or ECS or whatever in the future, but right now it's working for us. And again, we believe this is consistent with our principles. 
Um, but at the same time, uh, as like reducing our microservices, we're also observing increased use of AWS Lambda functions. Um, not to replace like core business logic in, in, our, in our monolith, but like to glue different AWS services together and run say simple pro data processing on that data. And so this is a pattern that um, we, we, liked, we, we like to see and we're investing in. Uh, and we think it would be too much effort to have to recreate say Lambda type functionality in our own monolith when we can take advantage of some great stuff that's coming out of AWS. And so um, we've seen increasing use of this in our environment and are starting to invest in it. Um, uh, D uh, Daniel Vassello is like another ex-AWS engineer um, and he's uh, wrote this t tweet uh, around the same time I was writing this uh, talk, which uh, I thought resonated of like thinking about lambdas as extensions as AWS services. So we think of our monolith as like the core place where our main business logic is applied. Uh, but lambda is pretty useful for like you know gluing S3 or like you know changing b simple bits of data and stuff like that. Final example. Um, so this was a pretty big project. Um, what, uh, what the goal of what we were doing here is uh, we had gotten all of our user data in MongoDB. So our users are our customers' customers. It's pretty important stuff. And it's uh, basically a, a set of a JSON document which described you know, what, uh, what attributes they had, what, site, what parts of their site they were on, what, bit, what subscription they're on. It's like fundamental to all, part, all use of intercom, really. Um, and uh, we chose Mon MongoDB seven, eight years ago uh, to replace a MySQL setup, which wasn't really scaling. And MongoDB was great. Um, it allowed us uh, to have like flexible, dynamic, uh, documents uh, that we didn't have to define up front, um, and also do all sorts of crazy queries on it um, pr pretty easily. As we grew, this kind of started to break down a bit, and so we ended up building Elasticsearch clusters to do the more complex searching, because part of the power of Intercom is to be able to do interesting things with our users. Um, and so uh, we also were using MongoDB in a kind of bad way. We were using lots of individual replica sets. So we had this pattern, um, and we just kind of kept on applying it and applying it and uh, kind of horizontally scaling by adding more and more replica sets. But um, this, this, this mixed with some complex indexes and some unclean ways of like the, the, the interaction between our monolith and, and use of Mongo meant that uh, we basically needed to evolve this and get to a more stable state and something that didn't require as much uh, effort to run. We, we didn't really enjoy running all these MongoDB servers. It wasn't consistent really with our uh, not wanting to run a lot of software. And so uh, we had the idea of, uh, or we knew there was a possibility that we could take uh, users and put them to DynamoDB, which we were pretty bullish on. Um, we did consider just evolving the use of MongoDB, but because we had to effectively write, uh, rewrite our own internal ORM, uh, or at least refactor or significantly change how things were being interacted with, uh, it would be the same amount of work if we were to go to this Greenfield MongoDB setup uh, using a far cleaner interface. Um, so by replacing with DynamoDB, we just got out of the business of having to worry about running MongoDB servers and got all the benefits of um, using a managed service. So this ends up being a pretty uh, big project, and we end up using lots and lots of different bits of AWS functionality, but it's got uh, the Rails uh, thing at the, as, at the center, as you can see, uh, which is where all of the main business logic is, but then we end up tying it together, uh, you know, using DynamoDB streams, Lambda functions, Kinesis, uh, uh, Kinesis streams to, to make sure that data got, when we saved it to DynamoDB, it got into the right place for the Rails monolith, uh, to query from Elasticsearch, or to know when we were hitting rate limits inside of DynamoDB. Again, like there's more functionality that's been released by AWS to give you insights into this. Um, but when we were building this about two years ago, uh, we had to build our own rate limiting stuff to look for hotspotting uh, users. Um, and so uh, we got to remove a lot of code uh, from our environment, some, some standalone services we had that were um, tailing the uplog in MongoDB. 
um, and uh, you know, making sure that the data was copied over to Elasticsearch and just you dropped in a lot of uh, AWS components to, to get that done. Um, and so, you know, this was a significant re-architecture. We learned about a lot of things that we, our assumptions that we'd made about the environment and changes over time. Um, but ultimately, we ended up with a infrastructure which uh, scales rap rapidly uh, like to far greater numbers, and we don't spend anywhere near the amount of time upgrading MongoDB servers and all that. Um, and so, you know, we removed all use of MongoDB from our production environment uh, just in the last few months. And so uh, we applied shipping to learn and building in small steps. Uh, one of the main things that we did was to separate out, uh, so our MongoDB setup had been using user identity as well as the user data and having them in one place. By that I mean the type of user and their uniqueness properties in addition to uh, what the data of the users were. Uh, and so we, we saw pretty early on that we could separate out these functions into a standalone MySQL setup um, which then allowed us uh, to like, break out that, that functionality separately and use DynamoDB for the hard stuff. Um, and so we, we also de-risked this project significantly by working with our technical account team and support team in AWS, uh, which meant that we were able to uh, get this out without, uh, without too much problems. Uh, so that's the end of the talk. So the, uh, the, the purpose of the, the three examples was to show how the, the principles are put in practice. There's obviously a lot of, a lot of detail in there and a lot of stuff I kind of brushed over, but um, I hope it was kind of useful to you, so the power of principles uh, and how they could be put into practice in your own organization. Thank you for all for listening. <laughs>